This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 292, recorded on July 20, 2023. I'm Vincent Taracaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Have you got really high temperatures there, Michael? No, we're one of the lucky places in the United States, our our weather is normal for July. We're in the 90s, and it cools off at night down to the mid-70s, and we get an afternoon rain shower. So, so Somebody on the stream yesterday from Tucson said it was like 40 degrees Celsius. Oh, yeah, Tucson's a night. Oh, my gosh. Also joining us from St. Louis, Missouri, Petra Levin. Hello. It's good to be here. I think our weather is characteristic as well. We get up into the 90s, uh, but it's also incredibly humid. So this morning, the dew point, I think, was 76. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> and my our windows on the outside, we have storm windows, but on the outside, it was uh, c- condensation because we're air conditioned inside our house, obviously. So yeah, yeah. it was So th- th- You have a river in uh, St. Louis, right? We have the Mississippi, the river. Yeah, the river. The river. Okay. So it, does it go through the it goes town? North, it goes north to south. It goes on the edge of St. Louis. It separates out uh, Illinois from Missouri. And we are in St. Louis, and there's a city in Illinois called East St. Louis on the other side of the Mississippi. Yeah. Are you close to the river at all? Um, I am about six miles east, west of the river. I think okay. we're about six miles. So you don't, you don't get any humidity effects from the river, I guess, right? I am not sure where our humidity comes from, but the Midwest in general is known for being extremely humid. Mm. And uh, it, right now it's extra humid. So. Yeah, we're, we're 30 Celsius here and uh, that's like 84 or something. 28 is 82, so maybe 84, 85. It's not that high. It is humid here too. It's typically humid in New York. You know, it's July. Yeah, it's fine. Pretty. I mean, towards the end of August, it'll start going down again. I don't mind. I mean, I'm inside all day. It's kind of <laughs> unfortunate. I'd rather not have to be inside. But uh, well, I'm wearing a jacket. Things My office do. is like a yeah. Meat I know. Locker. I wear a jacket uh, outside, a long sleeve jacket, and I get on the train. It's freezing. I go in some building. It's always freezing. So I always wear jackets in the summertime. It's really. Really funny. Yeah, I do too. I was told actually when I moved here to treat, because I moved from New England to treat Missouri summers like New England winters and avoid going outside as much yeah, as possible. Yeah, it's funny. Well, to do what we like to do here, which is to teach you some microbiology, we, we have to be indoors. It would be noisy. Although, you know, when when the weather gets good in the spring semester, the students are like, can we have class outside? <laughs> and like, I wouldn't mind, but it's kind of distracting and noisy. Everybody's playing frisbee, the dogs and cats running around, you know. So we have to stay inside. But uh, we're inside for your educational pleasure. You could listen outside for sure. And uh, we have a snippet first to start off from Michael. And the title of the snippet that appeared in the July 6th issue of Science Magazine is entitled Diet Microbe Host Interaction in Early Life. And it was an essay that earned the Noster Science Microbiome Prize for Christopher J. Stewart, who is at the University of Newcastle in the United Kingdom. Uh, the bottom line up front And this won't surprise many of us, though. Uh, It was a surprise to me as I delved into this more and more is human breast milk contains bioactive substances that are important for the proper development of the infant microbiome and likely future immunity of the host. Now, there's so much to unpack from that statement. And in his award-winning essay, Dr. Stewart walks us through the rationale and much of the evidence behind making such a statement. First, I think we all can appreciate that milk 
is a complex biofluid that has been continuously improved, as Dr. Stewart writes, through millions of years of natural selection or evolution, resulting in an optimal nutritional vehicle that provides not only food to the growing child, but these other bioactive compounds to the infant that with each passing year we are learning are essential for the proper development of the microbiome, our immune system, and overall general health. And as additional background, and the subject of this essay is that human milk oligosaccharides, or as he abbreviates, HMOs, are complex sugars that represent the fourth most abundant component of breast milk behind water, lipids, carbohydrates, including these oligosaccharides, and protein. And surprisingly, human milk contains less protein than cow's milk, uh, especially a proportion of casein. It's, it's much lower in that, which is really quite remarkable. And for the show notes, I've dropped in a review for those of you interested in human milk. It's entitled Human Milk, an Ideal Food for Nutrition of the Preterm Newborn, which makes more numerous than proteins or other vital nutrients, and they provide no direct nutritional benefit to the infant. That is, these oligosaccharides provide no nutri- no direct nutritional benefit to the infant. And one of the key takeaways that I took from his essay was this next sentence in the context of what I just said above, namely, if you really think about this at length, the statement that human evolution does not favor wasteful processes, which suggests that HMOs or these human milk oligosaccharides should play another crucial role in the development of the infant. Now, the author then takes us on this great adventure describing the value proposition that these human milk oligosaccharides likely offer to the developing human, and there's even experiments uh, using organoids that he describes at the end of his essay. And I really compel you to go and take time to, to look at this essay because it really describes how these HMOs act as a prebiotic, which is effectively a a nutritional supplement, if you will, not for the host, but rather the microbiome of the host. And it's this three-way interaction between our diet, the microbes, and the host that leads to the proper development of our what we know as our gut microbiome. As his early evidence, he offers first observations from the environmental determinants of diabetes in the young, known by its acronym as the TEDDY study. And I'll also drop two references about the TEDDY study into the show notes so you can take a look at those. They're both in the public domain. Stewart happens to be uh, the first author of the Nature TEDDY study that was published in 2018, where they described the results from over 12,000 longitudinal stool samples from more than 900 infants, where they found that the recipients, these babies who uh, were fed breast milk, was the breast milk was the most important factor shaping the infant gut microbiome throughout that first year of life, after which breastfeeding seldomly occurs. Microbiologically, what was remarkable was that their analysis showed that it was the species of bifidobacterium that were closely linked to this consumption of breast milk. And often when I instruct my students on the microbiome, I said, the first gift you received from your mother as you were transiting the birth canal was your initial microbiome, of which hopefully she gave you that first gift of bifidobacter from which you were able then to digest the milk that she was going to then hopefully feed you as you developed into your cell. Michael, if you get delivered by C-section, do you get bifidobacter? Nope. You get skin flora. And there's a whole body of literature 
on C-section babies versus vaginally delivered babies and how they're fundamentally different. And in Mm -hmm. fact, many OBs now, if they're going to deliver by C-section, will actually perform a vaginal wipe of the mother before delivery and then take that vaginal wipe and then inoculate the baby, rubbing their nose, their mouths, (laughs) and their ears immediately after the child is born via C-section in order to encourage. And there's a couple of papers. Marty Blazer was on one. There's another um, author whose name I'm blanking on. It's one of these hyphenated names. It's Bella something or other. And I'll drop that into the show notes as well. But this Teddy study was titled Temporal Development of the Gut Microbiome in Early Childhood. It's really a cool nature paper, and it's from 2018, so you should be able to to find it. But what Dr. Stewart went on... Well, actually, I have a question about this Teddy study. Did they find that C-section children are more likely to have certain issues later on, or eventually this all goes... Essentially, they catch up. They catch up. Okay. They do have some issues, but they do, by age five, they do catch up. And that's not especially from the Teddy study. It's from other studies that have subsequently been published. Okay. I have seen this. Both my children are C-section babies, but they uh, did not have any particular. So that, that's why I'm curious what the issues are of not having bifidobacterium. So. Uh, yeah, there's some of it they ascribe. Some kids will develop uh, asthma. If they don't, and it, it's just the proper maturation, but it depends on if there's siblings in the house, if there's dogs, if there's cats, <laughs> there's all sorts of other variables. Right. Exactly. It's not just, it's not just on the mother. It's just, don't blame the poor OB who said, you need a C-section. You're too small to, to right. deliver. And bad don't blood. blame the mother. <laughs> don't blame the mother. No, 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 no. And in fact... Uh, In full disclosure, I have worked in the past with our neonatologist team looking at this about 10 years ago, and these are two great neonatologists here at MUSC, um, Dr. Carol Wagner and Sarah Taylor, and they taught me much about breast milk and preterm infants, and and that's what Dr. Stewart's going to talk to us about in the rest of his essay, namely... We know very little about the preterm infant gut microbiome and how HMOs can modulate the preterm infant gut microbiome. I should define what a preterm infant is, and that is a baby born before 32 weeks of gestation has completed. Normal gestation is what, 40 weeks, and 32 weeks is about eight weeks early. And those children often spend a long time in the hospital in incubators. They're really tried to kept as aseptically as possible. And it's often very hard for the mother to nurse the child. There, there's feeding tubes often involved and they're not given milk. And so this is where Stuart's going to take us. And he saw that these HMOs modulate the preterm infant gut microbiome and increase colonization by bifidobacterium and reduce disease risk. He also offered that by providing the probiotics, they can deliberately modulate the preterm gut microbiome in a highly specific and reproducible way. And in the next section of his essay, he he offers that a child born less than 32 weeks gestation often has an immature intestinal architecture. And that's, you know, pretty much understood because during those last eight weeks of gestation, a lot is going on in the developing child. And what my friends in neonatology and Dr. Stewart is telling us is that Breastfeeding, especially supplying these HMOs, is very, very important because if they don't get the breast milk or these HMOs, 
many of the preterm infants can de- develop a condition known as necrotizing enterocolitis, which substantially increases their likelihood of complications. Their gut can collapse, and it's, it's really a very bad act. And one of the other things that they can develop is something termed a leaky gut. This is where the intestinal flora actually leak out into the sterile parts of the body and, again, wreak havoc. As Shakespeare said, they unleash the hounds of hell Mm -hmm. and the bacteria are just going everywhere. And unfortunately, when I was doing this work with our neonatologists, the sequencing tools available 10 years ago were not what we have available today. And Stewart's group offered us evidence from his and other groups that they have learned that certain types of bacteria, most notably these HMO utilizing bifidobacteria, may increase gut and immune maturation. And other work has also suggested a possible role of HMOs in the protection and the development of necrotizing enterocolitis. So Stewart's group then expanded their investigation of the role of HMOs in mother's milk and in the development of the longitudinal infant gut microbiome. And he did a really heroic study. He looked at 33 neck cases, necrotizing enterocolitis, and 37 match controls. And the HMO profiling that he observed was that a single HMO, the disahelolactonitrilinos, that he abbreviates DSLNT, was lower in breast milks received by infants who went on to develop neck and could predict disease with a high level of accuracy. And here's where I slapped myself up the side of the head and I said, wow, if we could just simply put that one HMO oligosaccharide into a formula that would then encourage the proper development of the gut. That would be phenomenal. And so Stewart and his team then went on to use univariate modeling that then determined an optimal DSLNT threshold for disease risk and modeled then how the developing preterm gut was affected by the presence of DSLNT above or below their modeling threshold. And the infant's that received milk with the DSNLT supplement below the threshold were associated with slower microbiome maturation and reduced colonization by preterm gut community types dominated by the bifidobacter. So they had bad bugs in their gut. Healthy babies who received adequate amounts of DSLNT showed quicker progression to potentially beneficial preterm gut community types. And he categorizes them in between one and five. And types four and five are the beneficial preterm gut community types that he abbreviates throughout his essay as PGCT. And type four was dominated by two bifidobacter species, longum and bifidum. And as you're going through Costco this week, <laughs> looking at the probiotics, um, you can see that some of the probiotics do have bifidobacter bifidum. Some have longman, but the PGCT was also dominated by bifidobacter brevin. Not all, you know, probiotics that are sold on the market at health food stores or even Costco are compounded the same. And that's one of the things that he addressed in this next question as he began to look at the link between HMOs and breast milk and the preterm gut community types, looking at the colonization. And you can well imagine they're doing lots of principal component analysis, trying to understand what's going on. So just to be clear, they're looking at the prebiotics not the bacteria, or are they looking at the bacteria, giving them the bacteria? Both, both. 
there, yeah, that's really important because that's very confusing, I think, for me sometimes, but for people it is. in general. So the prebiotics the, promote the growth of the bacteria that have a probiotic. Effect. And then they're looking at the bacteria. But in the next set of experiments that he's going to take us through, he acts, and this is diagrammed in the one and only figure in this Beautiful. paper. Yeah. He, he has two probiotics in Floran and Labanic. And I put into the show notes, you can go and read about them. They're a website that sells the stuff. I'm not endorsing the sale of this stuff. It just describes what's in them. It links to some of the papers. So I thought it was a convenient place. And people do not give your babies probiotics without doctors. No, no, no. Do not do that. <laughs> do not do that. Uh, uh, but what he did, and this was a very carefully controlled study. Here, he leveraged the Great North Neonatal Biobank in the United Kingdom, which has collected daily samples since 2010 to enable research into the preterm gut microbiome and immune development. And this time, the neonatal intensive care at his Great North Children's Hospital in Newcastle, UK, started using probiotics. Initially, they use in Floran in 2013, and then Labanec in 2016. Although the two probiotic products included the same species of Bifidum and Lactobacillus acidophilus, another common probiotic additive that you can find in your favorite jar at your favorite uh, supplemental store. They also had uh, Bifidobactum longum, in the Labanec, and the strains for each product were distinct. And again, what he learned and what I learned a long time ago when I was working on whole plant corn silage is that strains of the lactobacilli and bifidobacter matter. As they were observed that the difference in strains can lead to consistent and important impacts on preterm gut microbiomes, such that the infants that received Labanec quickly transitioned from their preterm gut community types of PGCT4, and infants receiving Infloran transitioned quickly to PGC5. Not surprisingly, in the infants in the NICU before probiotics were introduced, colonization by Bifidobactam was instead dominated by pathobionts. And recall from our last twin, a pathobionant is operationally defined as a symbiont that is able to promote pathology only when specific genetic or environmental conditions are altered in the host. And the absence of an HMO or this oligosaccharide alters the host such that it favors the growth of these pathobionants, which are our friends Escherichia and Klebsiella, which are not really all that great <laughs> in that brand new infant. And that's well illustrated in the top part of this crystal clear uh, figure. So longtime listeners of TWIM will appreciate that this is merely an association study up to this point albeit with substantially improved outcomes as their principal finding. But the Stewart group then went on to develop a method for generating intestinal organoids from preterm gut tissue. And he engineered an intestinal organoid physotic at P-H-Y-S-O-X which means that it's not the 20% atmospheric concentration of oxygen that we see, but rather in this very clever two-chamber system, he's feeding the tissue culture cells 5% O2, and on the other side of this gas-tight organoid tissue culture system, he's allowing the anaerobes to develop. So he's effectively growing the developing infant 32 week gut in a petri plate, <laughs> which is beautifully detailed 
in the lower panel mm. of his figure. You can see where the oxygen's going. He's got cute little O2 molecules. He's got the gas permeable wells with a 24 micro titer plate. So you can imagine how he's able to study what's going on. So he was then able to address the mechanism. And the first thing that they offered is that the preterm ilium derived organoids have distinct genetic expression when compared to the adult ilium derived organoids. And this analysis also then revealed to them critical links between the microbiome, namely that a good preterm gut community, uh, which we'll call our groups four and five with the good bifidos, with them having distinct host epithelial transcriptional patterns when compared to the other um, preterm gut community types, which are the bad actors versus media only control. And that upon the metabolic analysis of the stool, they observed that the good preterm gut community types were more comparably functionally similar despite differences in microbial taxonomy. So what this is telling you is that the HMOs are probably the great leveler in, you know, coordinating the development and succession of our microbiome as we go from principally eating a liquid diet as, you know, the newborn to transitioning to eating the foods that we're all now familiar with. And so, This takes me back and how I'm going to end this with the profound statement. Why did evolution put HMOs in milk in the first place if they offer no nutritional value to the host? And the answer to the question why evolution did that was it was anticipating the required mutualism, (laughs) which offers is is the important implication for the design of these preterm infant probiotics and ultimately leads us one step closer, as he said, to personalized medicine for gut health. And, you know, this is just but some of the first studies. I think organoids in the microbiome are the way we're going to begin to decipher much of what's going on. And I think the fact that he went and did the work on the transcription to see the distinct differences in transcription really uh, is going to help us decipher this very uh, critical problem because we're, we're developing, we're able to keep preterm infants alive and we're really struggling to try to get them through those first few weeks of life without any serious complications. Mm, So this is a neat study. Very cool. Or a neat essay. I <laughs> it is really neat. There, there's there's like 10 years worth of work packed into 1,200 words. Yeah, so good. in this idea about evolution, I was thinking about it because obviously evolution can't anticipate anything. But yeah. no, yeah. this is yeah. the opposite of how it works. But yeah. I wonder, yeah, where this – I mean, it's very subtle. You know, preterm infants also wouldn't have survived. So No. And we're, so we're, we're, and so th- this is like a really interesting question about the evolution. And I'd be really curious in other mammals, how this works. And my guess is, you know, even marsupials, which, are, you know, have these teensy, tiny, very underdeveloped uh, babies. Right? Well, that's the whole thing is, you know, when did we go from the marsupial to live birth? Well, is the marsupial the original? I think not. I would think it's like, uh, the, yeah, I, I don't. I, yeah, I feel like that's a branch, but I don't know enough about mammalian evolution. I know nothing about mammalian evolution. So this is something for Tweevo, Vincent. I, yes, please, please. <laughs> yeah, it was the pre- microbiome, it was, uh, the evolution of the microbiome. Yeah, it was before the marsupials. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, it doesn't anticipate. I, I agree with that. It, something else was going on there, and we just don't know what it is. But speaking of Klebsiella. I know. Speaking of Klebsiella. So the neck, actually, the data on neck is very interesting. This uh, this terrible necrotizing you know, intestinal infection that is in preterm infants. Um, there seem to be Klebsiella associated with it. But it's, as far as I know, still not completely clear exactly why some get it and some don't and which of the Klebsiella it is. Mm-hmm. But we are going to talk about Klebsiella, although not in preterm infants. 
Um, I know there are two different Klebsiella. One is there are different Klebsiella species associated with neck. Uh, yes. One of them, though, one of the several, I think, is uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is the one that is the focus of the paper and the commentary that I'm going to talk about today. Although I'm not going to talk about uh, pathogenesis too much, I will talk a little about Klebsiella. So the papers today are talking about capsule, which is on the surface of a lot of bacteria, a lot of environmental bacteria, and a lot of pathogens and has been associated with pathogenesis. Um, the paper is from 2020, uh, the Journal of Molecular Microbiology, and it's by Yi Han Tan, Yahua Chen, Wilson Chu, Lakto Sham, and Yun Huen Ganin. Uh, and they're in the Departments of Biochemistry and Microbiology at the National University of Singapore. And along with this paper, which is entitled Cell Envelope Defects of Different Capsule Null Mutants in K1 Hypervirulent Klebsiella Pneumonia Can Affect Bacterial Pathogenesis, uh, we've also put on the website a commentary by Olaya Ren Duelas of the Institute Pasteur, which is entitled Deciphering the Role of Capsule of Klebsiella Pneumonia During Pathogenesis, a Cautionary Tale. And I think the title of the commentary says it all. It's like we have to be careful all mutations, although they might all result on no capsule on the surface of the bacteria, are not created equal. Um, and I highly recommend this, ca this commentary. Dr. Wenduelas does a great job of explaining uh, capsule synthesis, which I will try to break down and do half a good, half as good a job as she did, which, like many pathways, involves a lot of gene products with similar sounding names. And but point out their figure; they have yeah, a really exactly. Great I will. <laughs> there is a really beautiful figure in Dr. Wendell Alice's uh, commentary about how capsule is synthesized. It's really a cheat beautiful. sheet. It's a cheat it's a cheat sheet. sheet. And I had it open the whole time I was reading the paper and the commentary. Super helpful. Okay, so just to take a step back, Klebsiella, as we just discussed, is a there are many species of Klebsiella. Uh, the one here though is Klebsiella pneumoniae. It's an opportunistic gram negative pathogen. It's a diderm, meaning it has a plasma membrane and then a paraplasm and then an outer membrane. It's closely related to E. coli. It's in the Enterobacteraceae. Uh, it's usually an opportunistic pathogen. Uh, it causes pneumonia and urinary tract infections, generally in the hospital in patients who are intubated. That would be the pneumonia or catheterized. That would be the urinary tract infection. It is increasingly uh, isolates are resistant to multiple uh, antibiotics. Um, it was number three on the, there was a beautiful paper in the Lancet published about Last year, I think, on 2019's data, 2019 data, Klebsiella was the third leading cause of deaths associated with or due to antibiotic-resistant microbes. And the strain in this paper is special in that it's associated not necessarily hospital-acquired, just community-acquired with liver abscesses. So obviously that can be really bad and lead to blood infections and death. And this strain is known as hypervirulent, it, which is kind of a vague term. It has a thick capsule, which is also a little vague. And this hypervirulent strains are associated with the activity of a gene called RMPA. So in Klebsiella, generally... There are 77 types of capsule, and these different types are associated with differences in the oligosaccharides that make up the capsule and other modifications. Changing capsule is one way for bacteria to Klebsiella to evade the human immune system. And the strain in this paper is one of these 77. It's called type K1, and it is, again, a hypervariant strain that is associated with liver abscesses. Okay. So that's Klebsiella. Um, and I should note this paper was suggested by uh, my postdoc, Dr. Sarah Beagle, who works on Klebsiella in my lab. And she's the Klebsiella whisperer. Thank you, because I love this paper very much. So capsule synthesis. And again, if you are listening and you can, not if you're driving, but if you're sitting, you could open up the commentary that we've linked to um, and look at figure one. But Capsule synthesis, like most things that are in the cell envelope, so that would be the plasma membrane, the paraplasm, the outer membrane is all together called the cell envelope, is synthesized. It starts in the cytoplasm. 
And the first protein, um, they're actually, pro it's called WCAJ. It's actually in the plasma membrane, but it links either glucose or galactose to undecaprenal phosphate. So undecaprenal phosphate is basically a universal carrier. I think my the textbook we use for microbiology calls it a cloak, but basically it allows the cell to take charged molecules, um, including capsule precursors or precursors for cell wall or things that go on lipopolysaccharide in uh, gram-negative bacteria or on tecoic acid in the gram-positive monoderm bacteria across that plasma membrane, right? You can't take a charged molecule easily across it. So cells use this cloak called undecaprenal phosphate, and they link the precursors to this carrier, which I will call from now on lipid 2 it's just sort of short, <laughs> shorthand for these things or undecaprenal phosphate. Anyways, and they link it to that. And then that can be flipped across the plasma membrane. So the first gene, WCAJ, links either glucose or galactose to undecaprenal phosphate. And that it allows it to be flipped into the paraplasm. Once it's in the paraplasm, that sugar is added to two other sugars. So in K1 variant, which is the one we're talking about, those three sugars, it makes a trisaccharide, are glucose, fucose, and glucuronic acid. So now you have a, a bigger precursor, and it's in the paraplasm between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. Okay, so that trisaccharide is made in the paraplasm. It's linked then where a protein called WZY polymerizes it with other trisaccharides to form long chains. Okay, so you, you make first the sugar on undecaprenal phosphate carrier, and then you make the trisaccharide, goes to the paraplasm where it's polymerized. Those trisaccharides, right, are polymerized together. So you get these three sugars in a row all made into long chains. Those long chains are then secreted through the outer membrane by another protein called WZA. So there's WCAJ, which you need to make the trisaccharide. It's not the only one, but it's the only mutant here. So without that, you don't get the precursor. WZY takes those trisaccharides and makes it into long chains. And then WZA takes those long chains and takes it from the paraplasm into across the outer membrane where it forms this sticky capsule on the outside of the cell. So if you have a defect in WCAJ, you don't get anything because you can't make that trisaccharide. If you have defects in the thing that polymerizes it, called WZY, you end up with collecting the trisaccharides, end up stuck in the paraplasm. And if you have mutations in the secretion system, WZA, then you get these long glycan strands stuck in the paraplasm. Um, again, we're just talking about one serotype, but the basic idea of making different capsules is the same. You have to make the precursor, you have to make the trisaccharide, then you have to polymerize it, then you have to flip it out. Classically, capsules have been thought to be all or nothing. The paper people are probably most familiar with is Avery McLeod McCarty, which is the rough and smooth pneumococcal strains. I don't know if there's if you've taken intro micro at all or genetics, uh, you have Pictures high in school biology or high school biology. I don't know if my kids learned that in high school biology, but definitely if you've taken a genetics class or microbiology, there are pictures of happy mice and not so happy mice and the rough colonies of pneumococcus or streptococcus pneumoniae don't have capsule. And if you inject them into mice, the mice are able to clear them. Their immune system sees the pneumococcus and can get rid of it. If they're capsulated, the colonies are smooth and that kills the pneumococcus. And Avery McLeod McCarty famously shows, or by process of elimination shows that it's DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, that's conferring the phenotype rough or smooth, uh, virulent or avirulent. But in any case, it's the capsule that's the star because the capsule is what allows the pneumococcus to evade the immune system and kill the mice. So here it's the same idea with Klebsiella, that in the host, at least, capsule is important because it protects, it helps the Klebsiella evade the immune system, is the idea. And it's 
all these mutants, despite them having different effects, making no trisaccharide, having trisaccharides stuck in the periplasm, or having the polymerized glycans cross the mem- you know, stuck in the periplasm, they've all been treated the same. No capsule, avirulent. Capsule, virulent. So this paper actually really beautifully shows that different steps if you make mutations in different steps in capsule synthesis, you get different outcomes. And before I get into it, I do want to point out, though, that even though capsule has been associated with virulence, lots of bacteria have capsule. And even bacteria that don't ever see a host of any kind, they're just out in the environment. So while we know a lot about what capsule protects from inside the host, why capsule was invented probably has nothing to do with the host. It may protect bacteria from changes in the environment, acting as some kind of buffer or osmotic shield. It may also protect them from antimicrobial peptides secreted by other microbes. Um, so there's a lot we don't know about capsule, especially if we step away from our bias towards understanding host pathogen interactions and really think about, okay, but why would bacteria have it before there were any hosts at all? Okay. So this back, this paper though really wants to understand are all capsule mutants the same or are they different? And they do this again. And this is the kind of paper I love where they lead the reader step by step in a logical order to try and figure out what is going on and whether these are all the same or all different. So the first thing that they do is they make have Klebsiella strains, their strain, which is either wild type or it's defective in the WCA. So doesn't make even the trisaccharide. Essentially, it's a complete null. There's not even precursors for capsules. WZY trisaccharide mutant or WZA, the glycans, the long glycan chains are made, but they're stuck in the periplasm. And they find that these make no capsule. So there are different ways to see if cells have capsule. They use one that actually I think is really lovely. Um, Cells with capsule, E. coli or Klebsiella, if you put them in a centrifuge tube or a little micro micro centrifuge tube, a microfuge tube, and you spin them pretty hard, the capsule gives them buoyancy and they don't pellet really very well. Normally, if you spin E. coli or Klebs yellow that doesn't have capsule, they all the cells go to the bottom of the tube and you get this nice kind of taupe colored pellet at the bottom and media on top. But when cells have capsule, you see something different where the cells that you can't get them to pellets, it's like trying to push a beach ball underwater. They stick up at the top and it's called a buoyancy test. And this is in figure one of the paper. It's so easy to it's tell. It's so easy to tell. Mm-hmm. Beautiful um, lesson. And you can see that all three mutants, when they make mutations in all three of these, you can't by this test, they all go to the bottom. They are also including in this paper RMPA, which is a regulator, which is thought to contribute to this thicker capsule and hypervirulence, this ability to form liver abs- um, abscesses. But clearly the RMPA mutant uh, is still buoyant so because it definitely still has capsule. So its problem is not that it can't make capsule, it definitely does. They also do something that warms my geneticist's heart, which is they complement, they put on plasmids, wild type copies of each gene and show that when they put the gene back, a wild type copy in trans on a plasmid somewhere else, they can essentially restore buoyancy. Okay, so we can all agree these guys at least are not making capsules sufficient to change buoyancy. The next thing that they do is they look at survival in human serum. So in human serum are these magical proteins that are called complement. And complement is the bane of every undergraduate microbiology student because there are a bunch of proteins which have similar names. But the basic idea is that these proteins can recognize bacterial cells independent of the rest of the immune system. You can take the serum, that straw colored stuff that separates out when you have blood taken, the red blood cells quickly sink and the straw colored liquid on top is serum. And if you add complement to bacteria, it will, these proteins will bind to the bacteria and actually drill holes in them. And complement is 
capsule kind of gets in the way of those proteins recognizing and binding and making holes in the bacteria. So bacteria that have capsule can survive being mixed up with human serum. And those that don't have capsule cannot survive that. Um, And remember, the best word you can ever remember about complement is MAC. And MAC (laughs) stands for Membrane Attack Complex, because that's what complement does. It drills a hole into the bacterial membrane. And without an intact membrane, the bacterium is dead. Nothing happens. No membrane, no bacteria. They are dead, dead, dead. It's an unrecoverable error. Exactly. Unrecoverable. And in figure 1D, they uh, show the survival in the different, in human serum. They're actually using 75% human serum. And they show that um, the mutants, none of them survive human serum because essentially they have no capsule to protect them from complement. Complement can come on, make assemble into the MAC complex and drill holes and kill the bacteria. So even all three of them, essentially, in terms of these tests for whether you have complement on the outside of the cell or not, the buoyancy test and the and the survival in human serum test, there's no capsule on the outside of the cell. Okay, great. This is totally expected and not surprising, but it's really nice and the complementation is really beautiful. And the genetics that they just walked you through enables you to understand the rest of the paper. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. But again, their question is, all right, they've shown you in vitro what's going on, but is this actually important? Does the body see these differently? So the next, they actually start to look at with cells. So they look at two different things. The first one is they look at phagocytosis. Macrophages, sometimes with the help of complement, recognize bacterial cells. They engulf them into the phagosome, and then that phagosome fuses with the lysosome and they get killed. So capsule kind of helps hide. It's hiding them from complement and it's hiding them from antibodies and it's hiding them from these macrophages. So they want to know whether the these three mutants, the ones that make that don't make the trisaccharide, the ones that make the trisaccharide but it ends up stuck in the paraplasm, or the ones that polymerize the trisaccharides into glycan strands, but they end up stuck in the par- paraplasm. They want to know if all of those are recognized equally by macrophages or, or phagocytic cells, or if they're differences. And both of the mutants that the one that makes the trisaccharides or the one that doesn't make the trisaccharides, those are recognized really well by the phagocytic cells. Yeah, that's what you expect. The secretion mutant, the mutant that essentially keeps a bunch of these glycan polymers but can't get them out, that's which was actually resistant. And I don't understand that result. They don't really go into it because, again, it doesn't have capsule on the outside. The stuff that would make up capsule is stuck in the paraplasm but the phagocytic cells don't want to deal with it. The wild type and the RMPA mutant, the mutant that makes them hypervirulent actually, are both can avoid the phagocytosis. The next thing that they look at is cell binding. Um, I think more interesting, they look at persistence in the gut. Actually, Klebsiella does not want to stick around in the gut. That's not where it wants to be. It wants to get through the gut. And it turns out that all three mutants, they basically treat mice with ampicillin to kind of get out any of the enterobacteria, as much of the enterobacteria that are naturally there. Then they give them large doses of the different Klebsiella, the wild type and the four mutants. And they look in the mouse poop and they find that the mutants actually are not passed as well through the digestive system. The three capsule mutants kind of get stuck in the gut a little bit better than the wild type and the RMP. So basically that's showing, okay, without the capsule on the surface, things stick. Okay, so all of this makes sense, except for the one result, which I think is still out there, which is why does the WZA mutant, which ends up with these polymerized strands, why is it able to evade phagocytosis? Um, But otherwise, this is what you expect. The phagocytic cells recognize them better and that they don't really stick very well. They can't adhere to the gut because they're covered in this kind of slimy capsule. 
I think the next experiment, the next question they ask is, what happens without capsule? Because again, I mentioned that capsule is also protective, just directly protective. It's not only for mating immune system, it might also protect the cell against my- antimicrobial peptides or other challenges. And to look at this aspect of capsule, they look at bile salts. So bile salts are things that are secreted into your intestine and they help change uh, sort of the character of the intestine. They select for different, they're antimicrobial. They are thought to modulate the composition of your microbiome and they do plating assays for bile salts because you can just buy them and mix them with media. And they find actually that the sensitivity to bile salts is interesting because the mutant that doesn't make anything, the WCAJ mutant that doesn't make any of the any of the capsule precursors or anything, is not sensitive to the bile salts. But the two mutants where you get stuck with either the trisaccharides in the periplasm or the you know these polymerized glycans in the periplasm, they are sensitive. So it seems like in this case, in terms of resistance to bile salts, the mutants that can't make capsule at all are much better off than the ones that end up with all these sugars stuck in their periplasm. And this actually raises a really interesting question, which is, it's not great necessarily to have all these sugars and polymers of sugars in your periplasm. Maybe it's that alone is making the cell sick or more sensitive to things like bile salts, which attack the cell envelope, or, and this is a really interesting problem that they don't go into, it might be due to sequestration of undecoprenal phosphate. So remember, I told you early on that the undecoprenal phosphate is essentially a cloak needed to move small charge things that are components of capsule or lipopolysaccharide or cell wall from the cytoplasm into the periplasm where they can start to be assembled. But there's only so much undecoprenal phosphate to grow around in E. coli, it's limiting. And so maybe all that undecoprenal phosphate in these cases without the capsule being flipped out is getting stuck onto these precursors and preventing cell wall synthesis. They literally just run out of gas. They just literally run out of gas. I I disagree with this actually because they show in the next experiment that the mutants all grow well in media, that they supplement with pig mucin to sort of mimic what's going on in the gut. And if you don't have undecoprenal phosphate and you can't make cell wall and you can't make LPS, you should be growing really slowly. So I, I kind of... Or snaking or snaking or something. Yeah, it's it's really important. And it's also, there's a very easy experiment that you can actually ramp up production of undecoprenal phosphate. So they could, I think, do that. I mean, I'm not necessarily expecting them to do that, but that is an experiment they could do. So I seem to, I favor the idea of just having all these sugars you don't need in your periplasm is bad. So they show that they can grow in this stuff. So actually all of the mutants grow well in this media supplemented with pig mutant. And when they do an in vivo competition assay, the WCA, the mutants that don't make any capsule at all grow fine again. So again, in the gut, not having any capsule is fine. You can get plenty of these things made. I think I'll get back to the... So they do also, though, do an infection um, and they look at the different mutants in a mouse infection and they are really interested if you have no capsule or cap or, or capsule plus. Um, the mutants that don't make any capsule are clear and you get healthy mice, just like the old Avery McLeod McCarty experiment with uh, pneumococcus, is totally different bacteria. Capsule is needed as a virulence factor. You can't really establish an infection without it. They do find that the RMPA mutants that um, lead to this thick capsule phenotype those guys are intermediate. In appearance, they have wild type levels of bacteria in all the organs except the liver. So remember this strain of Klebsiella specifically forms these liver abscesses. Um, so the RMPA mutants do have lower loads in the liver. So they speculate maybe that has to do with its effect on capsule. Although RMPA is a general regulator, it regulates other genes. So it's hard to know. I do think one of the 
things that they have in this paper, which is uh, mentioned in the commentary, but they don't really dwell on too much, is they have a really beautiful scanning electron micrographs in figure 2C of the different mutants. And they have the parental strain SGH10. And you can see what capsule looks like in SEM is it looks kind of spiky. It's unclear if maybe it's being secreted from specific points or if just that's what the fixation does. The RMPA mutant just next to it, you can see there might be a little less capsule, but you can still see quite a bit in the SEM. The mutant that doesn't make capsule at all, that doesn't bind the sugar to the undecaprenyl phosphate, looks just like nice rod-shaped bacteria, smooth surface. Um, but the two mutants that are ending up either with precursor in the paraplasm or with the long strands in the paraplasm, so WZY is the long strands and WZA is the secretin. WZY, you end up with trisaccharides. WZA, you end up with the long strands. Both those guys, and again, there's no real quantification here, but those cells look like they have pointy ends, as if maybe they have a defect in cell division, is my interpretation. And um, they don't look like nice clean rods like the WCAJ mutant does. They almost look like fusobacterium. I am not familiar with fusobacterium. It, it, it has that pointed end. Yeah, so that pointed end is really interesting. And again, if they're growing well, I doubt that it's due to sequestration of undecaprenyl phosphate, but it does look like they're having difficulty making a nice clean division plane or they're dividing more slowly. So they're sort of synthesizing uh, sort of into a point as they try and divide. Um, but I do think this is a really interesting and cautionary tale because, again, We've always, I've always thought of capsule as all or nothing, but it, taking a step back here, it's clear that capsule different mutations in making things that go on the cell envelope and are especially transported from the cytoplasm in the synthesis process all the way to the outside, we don't actually expect those mutants to behave the same. It also brings up this issue of what's going on in the paraplasm, because if you're accumulating trisaccharide sugars or you're accumulating these long glycan chains, you're going to change the properties of the paraplasm, both its osmolarity and its hydro, its hydro, hydroscopy, how much water it can hold. So you can imagine all sorts of things could go wrong in, this, in the paraplasm. And, you know, if the cell isn't happy and its cell envelope isn't strong, then it's going to have problems as a pathogen because it's got to, you know, go through, in, in this case, in their model, the gut, but it also is going to be subjected not only to the immune system, but just changes in osmolarity and the presence of antibacterial peptide, antimicrobial peptides and pH and all those things. And if your paraplasm is compromised because of these mutations, you're going to be sensitive to that in, even if it's not a, you know, specifically an antimicrobial response by the host. Interesting story. Capsule continues to intrigue after all these years. I like it. You just need to look. Mm. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> you need to look at yourselves. Thank you, Pedro. You said that on the day, first day you were on Twim. I, I say that all the time. You got to look at yourselves. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, Pedro. That's Twim292, show notes, microbe.tv slash Twim. Questions and comments, Twim at microbe.tv if you enjoy our work. Please support us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Michael Schmidt, Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Petra Levins at Washington University in St. Louis. Thank you, Petra. Thank you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.